I want to welcome everybody tonight. Yeah. I will be happy to let everyone know that there is Spanish interpretation. So please go right ahead and get yourself situated. Um, with that said, my name is Kia Middleton Murphy. I'm the acting director for the Department of Special Education Services. And I will also have Ms. Crop introduce herself as well. Good evening, everybody. I'm Amy Crop, Director of Pre-K Special Programs and Related Services. Nice to see you all again. And Ms. Diana Wiles has joined us. I'll let her introduce herself. Good evening, uh, Diana Wiles, Associate Superintendent for the Office of Special Education. Thank you so much. So we have a very robust agenda this evening. We're going to hear from our uh, Family Support Services Coordinator, Ms. Mary Beth Mazzaranis. Thereafter, we have our very own um, co-chair coordinator, um, Ms. Brooke Levy, who's the executive director for the Down Syndrome Network. And then we have Ms. Catherine Malcotti, executive director from the Office of District Operations, to talk to us about the school year calendar. Thereafter, Ms. Donna Clefman, who is the coordinator in the Student Leadership and Student Service Learning Office, will speak to us about student service learning. And then we will have um, Mr. Andre Berno Coates and Ms. Catherine Lucas Logbo from LIST to talk about um, some of the resources from the Maryland Community Connection. With that said, I do not want to waste any of our time since we have a full agenda. So um, Mary Beth, we are open and excited about what you have to share. Oh, I'm so sorry, our co-chairpersons. Please, um, I know Ms. Bloom is not with us, but I did see um, Dr. Jen Fang, if you want to come off mute, and I know that Brooke is here as well. Hello, good evening. Nice to see you again. And uh, um, I, I'm looking forward to hear and learn so many things tonight. I, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Brooke Levy. Um, I have a... Um, 15 year old who receives special education services. If you have not already met me, I'm also the executive director of the Down Syndrome Network of Montgomery County. Welcome everyone. Okay, I think um, Connie was not able to join us this evening. Um, is Allison with us? Okay, I don't think she's able to join us as well. So we'll keep moving. You can click again. Mary Beth. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Mary Beth Mansoranis, and I am the Family Support Services Coordinator uh, for Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, this slide is really, it's just an opportunity for you to access um, some really important websites. The first is the special education website, which provides lots of information for you about, in general, what's happening in special ed talks about the services and oh thank you to whoever's sharing it this way um it you know it allows you to really see some of the services that are provided and to give you some key information you'll also notice on the left side it'll say family support and the top button there is is me and then the next one said ccac so if you go to the family support page um which is the second um link that i put on the slide this is what you'll come up with um, and it gives you my name and information. That's my cell phone number. Um, you can always call the office number as well because I am only part-time. Um, and we've direct, we've created this list of family resources. It's an, uh, a resource bank. So if you look at the advocacy and support, you'll see different organizations that sort of fit under these categories. It is still a work in progress. Um, we had some staff members this summer work on it. Derek has been working really hard to um, help put it into this presentation format where it's, you know, we have the icon and information about each of the sites. So um, one of the nice things about this is that hopefully it'll give you information that's needed sort of in an immediate sense. It doesn't stop you from reaching out to me or from reaching out to your special ed supervisors or reaching out to your case managers or your parent you know, community coordinators or, you know, whomever. But um, it does sort of give you the information at your fingertips. Uh, down below, it'll also give you links to the workshops that we're hosting. Um, and then down at the bottom, we're still working on the, there's a lot of links about um, things from the past, which may or may not be 100% updated. So we're still working on that. 
And then there's the MSD guide section. They put out some great resources on um, the IEP process and helping parents to understand it. So if you haven't seen those yet, I 100% recommend that you do that. And then um, the other slide that's actually on, um, or the other department that I think is really important for you all to be aware, of, particularly if you're the parent of someone who's 14 or older, is the transitions unit. Um, they have excellent information on their website, and they also at the top talk about like their next workshop, um, which I think is, was that... Yeah, that was yesterday. Okay, I was gonna say, I think we they had one yesterday. Um, and then, but if you scroll down on this page, the transition planning part is excellent. And then there's also um, the third box over there is about trainings and, and meetings for parents. It's just really an excellent website for those of you who are have, seeing your kids with special needs moving through the educational process and really all of the planning that goes along with it. Um, you know, you guys are amazing, but there's a lot, right? So um, this department does an, a really great job of helping you to sort of understand what needs to happen next. Um, so we want to make sure that you had those websites and that, you know, now you've sort of got an eye on them and it's something you can explore at your own um, pace. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that we have held three workshops for school-aged uh, parents of school-aged students and two workshops for parents of preschool students over the past two weeks. Uh, we've had really great feedback from families and we, we create our topics based on feedback we've received from parents from the Maryland survey, which this will be my plug, that that's coming out. Um, it'll be out, I think, released probably in February, but you're gonna start getting information about it. Um, so I'm just putting it on your radar now. Um, and, you know, the big thing that parents always tell us is that they are looking for trainings, they're looking for community resources, and they're looking for connections to families who have students similar to theirs, right? So um, that's our goal. And those are the things that we're working on in terms of the workshops that we're presenting. So um, just some upcoming workshops for um, early December and late November, we have uh, one just for pre-K families. So those will go out from all of the parent educators, we'll send it out to their families. And it's on behavior strategies, uh, that's on November 29th. And then we are holding one, uh, accessing the resources of the Montgomery County Public Library. I mentioned this briefly last, maybe two times ago, the public library has great resources for everybody. Um, and for our families of um, who have students who have special needs, it really is a great place for you to um, to have your kids go. There's so many um, programs that are offered and there's lots of resources. So that's what you'll find out about on the sixth. And then for secondary families, uh, Transition is planning a parent workshop on uh, college. So again, if you go back to the Transition website, um, that information will be there for you. Um, and I think that's it. So thank Mayor you so much. You, you yes. did have one question, whether or not those upcoming workshops will be recorded. Um, so that people can watch them if they cannot make it. So here's what I'll be, I'll be so transparent with you. What has happened the last two times is that we've had, um, and I'm going to say it's probably user error, meaning me. Um, we have not been able to record them, but what we are doing is posting. So the first workshop that we did was on, you know, basically helping parents get organized for IEP meetings. And it's in, almost in a flyer format. So that flyer will be posted and there are active links in it that you can access. And then the one we just did was on building collaborative and productive partnerships. And we're going to put the slideshow on my website. So it'll be in the Family Support Center page. Um, and we will work on getting the next ones recorded. Thank you so much. And I do just want to reiterate to families or parents, uh, guardians, Please do not hesitate to call my office. We're more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Mary Beth is also willing to do that as, um, as well. So you can certainly email her or call our office and we can connect you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Normally, we also receive updates from our partners from um, uh, Rec and Community Services. I don't know if a representative is here this evening. Hi, it's Sharon. I am here. <laughs> Okay, I, I didn't see you on there. It's because it's Sharon Nucci, right? North CO? 
Norcio, okay, thank you so much. Sharon, do you have any updates for us? You're, you're welcome. Hi, um, I just wanted to just give us a, a quick plug on three items happening um, with us. Uh, registration did open on Monday for winter classes and programs. So people can go in anytime now and register for our programs and classes. Um, we will be having a low STEM um, family fun day with Santa on December 9th at Holiday Park. It is free. Um, I can post that link to that one down in, in the chat. And then I just want to also encourage families, especially parents who if they ever have a minute to breathe, <laughs> um, they can do our free in 24. It used to be free in 23. Now we're doing fit in 24 for free gym and weight room memberships. Um, and so that's for anybody who lives in Montgomery County. You can get that. And if you need to just go walk the track at Wheaton or you want to take, you know, your kids during the family times, you have to check each each community center has its own schedule. But there are some family gym times where you can just go and and play games and have fun. Um, or, you know, for if you're 16 and up, um, they can use the weight rooms. So um, good things happening in rec. We just met with Montgomery Village and the city of Gaithersburg Recreation today. And we're looking at how we could partner with them so that um, those areas that are a little sparse in therapeutic recreation programs, maybe we can partner and, um, and add some new programming. So we are excited about that. And we will have, um, we'll continue with our kids day out and our break camps. So I'll drop that in the chat as well. So thank you. And real and quick, we will also have um, Sharon at a meeting for parents in January, early January, so that you have time to hear about summer options um, before all of those classes go live. Yep. And we're, believe it or not, we're building summer camps this week. They're due by Wednesday. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you. So Ms. Brooke Levy, the executive director of the Down Syndrome Network of Montgomery County, as well as uh, one of CX co-chairs. Thanks for inviting me to speak about the Down Syndrome Network of Montgomery County. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, my name is Brooke Levy. I already introduced myself today. So we can just um, go straight through to the next slide, please. Um, and I can put my email in the chat um, in a little bit. Um, I've been the executive director for about five years now. Um, we serve individuals with Down syndrome, both in Montgomery County, but in the surrounding regions. Uh, and I will say that so much of what we do overlaps with students and adults, and I should say children with um, other intellectual and developmental disabilities as well. Um, next slide, please. So we are a nonprofit and we are a mission driven organization and we serve communities through um, education, information, public awareness and advocacy. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we um, move through the slides. Uh, we, you know, are ultimate vision is that all people with Down syndrome and their families feel a sense of belonging um, in the communities in which they live and that they are welcomed uh, by all and then of course live self-directed lives of their choosing. Next slide, please. So a few years ago, um, and we're actually this year in 20, well, next year in 2024, we will be coming up with our next strategic plan. Uh, but Right now, uh, through um, the middle of 2024, our um, our focus has been on really um, bringing more diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and that sense of belonging within our organization. And we work very hard. We have a very diverse community. Um, just like all of Montgomery County. And so we, of course, want our organization and expect our organization to reflect that. And so we've worked very hard on that with our board, with um, staff, with our activities and who we and how we serve people and making things accessible. Uh, we do a lot of IEP support for families. We have a new parent-to-parent -parent mentor program 
that is launching in January. We also uh, serve families from birth to adulthood. And so um, we do a ton of different kinds of programming. And then we also have a new family medical outreach program for families who are either new to the area uh, and or um, are new, have newly give, given birth to a child with Down syndrome. So we don't just deal, you know, we don't just serve school age um, families, but we also serve, you know, like I said, from birth to adulthood. Next slide, please. So some of the things that we do is we do have that new family outreach. And within that, we also have a medical outreach program where we <clears throat> connect with um, hospitals, medical professionals, uh, so that they uh, are up on the most relevant information about people with Down syndrome, because there's a lot of misconceptions. And sometimes people either don't use the correct language, or um, they don't just have a good idea of what people with Down syndrome can actually do and how amazing they actually are. Um, again, through our lifespan programming, we have parent and guardian workshops. We have parent support. Uh, we have a group of Latino. Uh, it's a that's a really large group, um, and they mostly now communicate through WhatsApp. It's been real very ha helpful um, to the communication within those within those particular families. Uh, we have large annual and social events, including dances, summer picnics. Um, and of course, our step up for Down syndrome walk, and we have our we have a an education and educators conference um, called the Techniques for Success, and we do it annually, and uh, that is for both teachers, administrators, therapists, uh, and parents, anyone who comes in contact with a person. Um, with Down syndrome and, and other intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that's been an incredibly successful conference where we've offered um, credit for like continuing ed credit. And then also for parents to get lots of resources and information on how to, to navigate life with a, a person with Down syndrome. We do a lot of advocacy um, and we uh, provide resources. I just wanted to say, in terms of advocacy, we work on many different levels. We do work at the state and local and national levels to either work on bills that come into the government, but then we also, as um, Kia knows very well, we advocate within um, Montgomery County Public Schools. So if there's something that's not quite right with some of our families, we, I, we are very quick to speak up and we have a really good relationship with MCPS. So uh, we want to keep that and at the same time, make sure that our students are getting what they need um, from within the school system. And then also in other areas of their lives, whether it's employment or whether it's um, career and college readiness, uh, whether it's um, in preschool or in the hospitals and just all aspects of life. We're really working on many different levels. And then of course we have lots of resources to offer families. All right, sorry, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, one of our most, uh, our new family medical outreach program is one of our largest programs. We recently hired a new person um, who I'm not sure if she's on this call or not right now, but she does have a child in MCPS or actually she has several children. Uh, and she uh, is usually the first person that gets a phone call if a new baby is born. And so we provide welcome baskets to our families because we want, like I said, having that sense of belonging and feeling welcome in a community uh, when you have a new child with Down syndrome is so important to our families. We want people to, we want everyone to feel as though they belong within the Down syndrome community and within whatever community they're living in and just have the support they need to navigate life with a person with Down syndrome. We do have a new parent mentor program that uh, we have, uh, we got an, a lovely donation from a local family and gave us the capacity to develop an awesome new parent mentor program that will be launching. And like I said, in January, we're very excited about it. Uh, we do have gatherings. We have, like I said, um, we reach out to local hospitals and medical professionals and do education there as well. All right, next slide, please. So 
really, we, as you can see, yes, there are cute pictures here. <laughs> we really do work. And, and the, the youngest one is not yet in Montgomery County public school system, except for actually, I shouldn't say that infants and toddlers, but, but these two young men who are now in their twenties and thirties, they went through MCPS. <laughs> and so we really do meet the gamut, the needs of many different age groups. And, and so that those pictures are there just to depict that. So please go to the next um, slide. So some of the programs that are really popular is we have a teen hangout. You can see here, this is an older photograph from during COVID because we had to put everything online. All of the younger students here um, are in MCPS at, currently. I, I'm just looking at them and they are actually, they're all looking at the age group here, they are all in high school at one of the high school programs now. And back then that was middle school, they were in middle school. And so we really have done a good job at moving online to offline and now we're hybrid. And so we have a very strong teen group. They meet in person now. Um, and we've even branched out to bringing in peer mentors from actually within MCPS who are interested in um, becoming friends with people with intellectual disabilities. So that's been a great relationship. We've also brought in some families who kids have developmental or intellectual disabilities that don't even have Down syndrome, but they want this friends group that's developing and they're like a cohort moving along in their in their schooling and becoming and are great friends. We also have for adults, uh, and this is really mostly 21 and up, although there's a few 18, 19, and 20 year olds that sneak in there. Um, positively speaking workshops where we partner with uh, Artstream, which is a, another nonprofit to offer communications and self-advocacy workshops. We also now have received a new grant from the Global Down Syndrome Foundation, where we have a self-advocate community network. So they are deciding what they want us at the Down Syndrome Network of Montgomery County to do to support the activities that they want to do. And it's run by self-advocates with the support of um, staff and volunteers with the Down Syndrome Network. So that's a great way for our teens will eventually move into that group. And so we're, uh, we have different groups of people that kind of move as cohorts through our programming. Next, please. So again, we have lots of speaker ser series. You know, Mary Beth was just talking about all the wonderful programming that M MCPS offers. And some of what MCPS offers is similar to what we do and some is not. So, you know, we do offer educational um, workshops for families and how to, uh, about the IEP process, just like MCPS offers that, but we also offer it, we partner with MCPS. We also uh, realize that there's a lot of topics related to Down syndrome and just related to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, that aren't necessarily covered in school. So just about the ABLE Act in general and how can we people set up those uh, accounts and how can we save money for our kids when you know we as parents are not no longer uh, around. Uh, and then also so about trust and also sexuality and developmental disabilities because uh, people think oftentimes, oh, my kid's not going to want to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Oh, uh, how wrong are we on that? Let me tell you, I'm in the middle of it. I have a 15-year-old daughter <laughs> who is just like all the other 15-year-old girls around her. And so having, um, having we just actually got a, a grant and we're going to be doing um, sexuality and relationship um, workshops for um, our our members, which I say members, it's not a paid membership, but for our, for our community. And so um, lots of about futures planning, you know, what do we want for our um, loved ones with Down syndrome or intellectual disabilities, you know, as they get older, what did they want? Um, so we do that. We do career and co college readiness programming. We do talk about, you know, what's the difference between guardianship and alternatives. And we bring professionals in to do those um, presentations. In fact, tonight I'm missing one. There's one on social security right now uh, for a lot of um for a lot. So we have a lot of workshops. Yes. And just, and I'll put the, um, our website and all of these programs are past workshops that we've had and they've all been, um, 
they've all been recorded. So even when we have topics like guardianship and alternatives, I mean, that's going to be uh, that it won't change necessarily always year to year. So we still have it recorded and it's on our website and I can put that on there. I see somebody's asked how to get that information and I can do that after I'm talking. All right, go ahead. Oh, there it is. There's our website. <laughs> all right, go to the next slide, please. So we also have a private listserv. Uh, we have a Facebook a group, both private and a general page, lots of gatherings, workshops. And we have, like I said, the mentor program for parents. Uh, I highly recommend if this is something you're interested in be for your becoming part of our community. And it's, I mean, like I said, there's no fee to become a member. There sometimes are fees to come to our events, but nothing is, uh, there's always scholarships and we don't want to prevent anyone from joining in what we do. Um, and we do have lots of programming that folks are welcome to. Next slide. Okay, so we like I mentioned the Grupo Latino earlier. We have about 70 families um, within the Down Syndrome Network of Montgomery County and growing. I'm telling you, I feel like in the last year, most of the new babies that we um, are notified on how our families to Spanish speaking um, or babies from, um, uh, that belong to Spanish speaking families. So this is a really important group to our community. We have at least two people on our board and then others who are first, you know, where uh, Spanish is the first language and they they meet monthly, they have social groups sometimes that are separate. It's a wonderful affinity group where they can get together and ask the questions that they need to and get them answered in the language that is the most comfortable to them in, in terms of being of Spanish speaking families anyway. All right, next slide. So the step up for Down syndrome walk, I'm sure that lots of you have heard about that. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time. We just finished ours. It's a huge event. We have, we generally have between six and 700 people come just from Montgomery County. And that includes our partners, sponsors, and lots of families who obviously have loved ones with Down syndrome. Um, it's a wonderful, it is a fundraiser. It's our largest fundraiser of the year. Um, and it's, our largest just fun event where people come together and celebrate um, our loved ones with Down syndrome. All right, next slide. And that, well, I should say that was the buddy walk. That's what people used to call it, the buddy walk. We call it the step up walk. <laughs> um, we have lots of social events throughout the year. I mentioned some of our larger ones. There are smaller ones too. Like we have play groups where families just get together at a playground or they say, okay, let's go to, you know, this activity and let's just, or ice skating or um, going out for, you know, pizza or going to a movie, having, um, you know, a pool party, going to baseball games. We always get at least two or three times a year, we always get baseball tickets from the Nats. They're very generous with our community and all, all that's all free. We don't charge for any of that. And so uh, it's just a wonderful way to build community uh, within um our organization and families. And I mentioned Techniques for Success. If you have not been to Techniques for Success, uh, we generally hold it in the fall uh, and we will be, um, our plan is to hold it a year from now because with COVID, our dates got messed up. And so we got on a different schedule. Uh, and so we will be holding it again in the fall of 2024. Uh, so you'll just have to be out on, on the lookout for that. It's very well attended. We get national and local speakers to support our families and educators um, who work with people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. All right, next slide. So advocacy and partners, we have tons of partners throughout the, the county and um, statewide and nationally. We work together to, um, you know, get bills passed. We work together if something's not quite right. You know, we work with the Maryland Department of Education. We have something that's called the um, the Maryland Down Syndrome Advocacy Coalition and all of the down, there are five Down Syndrome Associations in Maryland and we all work together to, um, for, to build capacity for people with Down Syndrome um, in many ways. 
All right, next slide. And so we now have three staff, which is very exciting. Um, we also have a couple contractors as well, one of whom is an adult with Down syndrome. He runs our teen program and the self-advocate community network. Um, but we have Christy, Joy, and myself, who are our current staff members. And they, you know, the information about all of us can be found on the website. And um, just thank you so much for having me tonight. I think I spoke longer than 10 minutes. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, if anyone has questions, feel free to email me. I see my emails on there. Um, I'd be more than happy to um, answer any questions and support you in any way I can. No, thank you so much. We appreciate that. That information is great. And people asked for additional information. So that means that, you know, it was necessary and, and uh, it was wanted. So thank you, Brooke. Um, and we look forward to more updated information. How about that? Sounds great. Okay. Miss Malcotti. Hello, everyone. Yeah. I am Kat Malchody. I'm the executive director for district operations. And one of the fun things that I get to work on is the school year calendar, not for this school year, but for next year. So I'm going to share my screen. I only have a few slides, so I'm going to go through them and just kind of talk to you a little bit about the process for this. All right. So we build a calendar in MCPS. We do it every year. We usually do it in the fall for the next year. We're looking at trying to push it a little earlier so that people can do some long-term planning. But what we try to do with our calendar is really think about maximizing instruction and you know, sort of that operational piece of it, making sure that everyone's where they need to be so that our kids can learn and learn well. I was a teacher in the county for many, many years. And so this work has been really fun because I always looked at it from the teacher perspective and looking at it you know, more holistically, it, there's a lot to consider. Um, the other thing that we always wanna do is think about keeping that lens of equity for all of our students, as well as thinking about the work that we've done in the anti-racist audit. So I was so excited to be able to come here because I think one of the things that we really wanna do is that we've strived to do is hear from as many of our families, our staff and our students as possible so that when we put, you know, sort of these pieces together, we're in front. Um, and so that's been really exciting. Um, we have a policy. The policy has some rules. My favorite part of doing this work is that my the students all want to start school like really late, like way after Labor Day, and they want to get out really early, like Memorial Day. And it's so funny because when I say it to grownups, they're like, oh my gosh, don't they know about the 182 days and the this and the that? And I was like, yeah, but it's it's fun to dream. Um, and so we've gotten a lot of fun feedback about that. But in general, we do have some parts of our policy that we have to follow. Um, and these are a few of them that you can see on the screen. The policy is linked in there. It was updated in, I think, 2019. Um, and so it really you know, gives you some of those guidelines. One of the things that was really fun this year that I was able to do is because I got to do it for the first time, I said, well, can I do it differently? Can I show people a calendar in a different way? Like I'm a parent, I have to go pick up my son in about a half an hour from sports. So I need those weekends to show me what's going on. I really need to see that big picture. Um, and so the initial survey that we put out, we got almost 27,000 hits um, from people. And it was asking questions about, you know, the beginning of the school year, sort of Thanksgiving, um, spring break, winter break, and kind of giving us guidance on how to build the calendar. So that way, when we put out drafts, the drafts were based on something. And so this was really the first part of it. We had a lot of fun with this. We went to bus stops. We, I took that thing everywhere. This little girl came up to me at the girl summit and she's like, you're that calendar lady. And I'm like, why yes, Cat Malchody, I am. Um, and so it's just been really fun and we've had a good time. And our student member of the board has been incredibly supportive of this work. Um, and we're just excited that we've had so many people really weigh in on it. We have an internal committee, we have an external committee. Um, and we've really tried to just reach out to people in different ways. And so with this initial work, we really sort of 
zeroed in on a few different things. One was that people either wanted to start before Labor Day or after Labor Day. At the time, everyone thought I was crazy for even asking if people wanted to go to school on December 23rd, even though it's technically an instructional day. Um, they also wanted those half days in Thanksgiving, especially as you get closer to Thanksgiving and people are thinking about, you know, having a little bit of time off. And, you know, people wanted an earlier spring break because in this school year, spring break is really late, whereas in the year after, spring break can be a little bit earlier. And so really thinking about that from the lens of, um, you know, different perspectives. So after that, we started also talking about the format because someone said to me, well, can't you just make a calendar that looks like that? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Let me ask. And so we asked and we were able to actually add this format. And so instead of taking away the, you know, the traditional horizontal calendar that all my teacher friends love, we're going to have two. So we're going to have that monthly format on a one pager so that a family can really look at it and see the weekends and really plan sort of big picture. And we're going to keep the traditional one with the horizontal um, days because people are used to that. And some people really um rely on that for their planning purposes. And so that's been something that's been really fun to look at. Um, you know, and it was something I, I just asked the question. I said, can I? Am I allowed to do that? And you know, they were like, why not? Let's try it. And so that's gotten a lot of positive feedback. Um, as I said, we've tried to really go out and do a lot of things. We've gone to bus stops, we've worked with our committees, we've worked um in different spaces like this. Um, where we've gotten to talk to different groups of people. I've had phone conversations with people, Zooms one-on-one -on -one with people. Lots of people like to weigh in on it. Um, one of the most rewarding things I got to do this week was to go to a food pantry um, or food market, they call it, at one of our elementary schools. And there are hundreds of families there. And I had a student interpreter and we walked around together and we asked people if they would give feedback. And, you know, it was a space where there were families already gathering. We weren't asking them to take time out of their day. And it was it was pretty special. I'm going back next week. Um, but really trying to think outside the box and come up with different ways to find people where they are. With that said, I do have the new survey for you. So once we went through that process, we had to then say, okay, now we're gonna put out some drafts. So that's what we have right now. I do not have 27,000 hits yet. It's only been out for a week. I have about eight or 9,000 hits on my, on my survey. I'm hoping to get more by then. And I'm gonna make sure that you have these slides so you have the QR code and you can please, please, please take the survey. Um, it's all over the place right now. And like I said, there's a whole timeline with this because we work with policy management and the board. And so the next big thing that we're doing is Tomorrow, we're going back to the policy management committee and we're kind of bringing them our first round of feedback. I'm going to share it with you first so you get to see it first. But just the idea of like, where are you now in the process? What's come up? What's what's bubbling? And then we actually go and adopt the calendar in December. So on the 5th at the board table. And so that's kind of the process that we go through to develop this. And this has been years in the making. I've actually been watching some of the old board meetings with some of the players and you know you see all different people at the table when you look at some of the calendar de development over the year so it's been pretty fun and then oh, hold on let me see if i can exit this and kind of show you where we are so this is our calendar that we have out currently it is available in all the languages and it's linked so it just feeds into my survey, so you don't have to take a separate survey. It has the two versions of the drafts. It also has pop-out versions if you need to like hold the paper in front of you. And it just asks really simple questions. Which one do you prefer? And then additional feedback. And I can tell you my favorite thing has been going through the additional feedback. I have about, I think 1,500 um, pieces of additional feedback at the moment. And so I'm kind of going through that. There are a couple themes that keep coming up that we'll talk about tomorrow when we go to policy management. And it's been great because they don't have to answer a lot of questions. People are more likely to get feedback. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback just on the style of it. I can show you the first one that we did. Um, you know, it was very aesthetically pleasing and people just said they loved like just voting and just kind of looking at it and, and seeing a big picture. Um, and so that's been really exciting for us because one of the things that we wanted to do was to make it accessible. You know, I want 
a fifth grader at a bus stop to be able to talk to me about the fact that they don't want to go to school during winter break. And, you know, my 80 year old father-in-law who drives my son to school sometimes thinking about, you know, sort of school from his perspective as a community member. And so really trying to bridge that gap and bring people together to talk about it. And so, as I said, we're really excited for this work. Yep, 8,200 at the moment, still flying up. You'll see it all over the place, but I will share the link to it so that you can vote. You can share it with anyone that you are able to. And we're really asking for people not only to weigh in, but to also give feedback. Um, you know, as I said, we really think about operational considerations and instructional considerations and thinking about the amount of time that we balance being in school and being out of school and where, you know, sort of those benefits are for families, for students, for staff, for everyone. And so it's been, you know, I would say a lot of fun doing this and getting to know people and learning things. Um, and I think every day I've learned something new about some culture or some aspect of, you know, people's feedback that has been really rewarding. So please, please, please fill it out. Please give us feedback. And you'll see me at the board table, I think, tomorrow if you want to watch policy management and December 5th um, at the regular board meeting. But yeah, no, um, I'm Kat, the only Cat Melchody in the in the district. So if you have any questions or you want to email feedback. You can send it directly to me or you can send it through any of the wonderful people who are hosting us this evening. And that's it. I just wanted to say thank you. I think I see one question from Ms. Battle. Did you want to come off mute to ask, uh, to ask um, uh, Kat a question? Yes, I did. Thank you for that. Um, I am actually <clears throat> born and raised in New York, so I grew up going to school <clears throat> and starting school after Labor Day. Yep. So being down here and and having this, I'm sorry, sweetheart, having this, um, you know, starting in August was odd for me, but I still struggle as working parents <clears throat> finding care in those breaks between end of school and camp starting and yeah. camps that work for children yep. that may have different needs, as well as at the end of the summer where there's, you know, camps end on the 11th, on the 18th. And I still work a full-time job and don't have, you know, and I, and I know I'm not the only one. I'm, I'm just curious how we are partnering or potentially thinking about engaging camps when we're thinking about shifting school because childcare across the board, whether or not it's pre-K, daycare, Montessori, private school, public school, it's, it's a challenge for parents. So I'm just yeah. curious what thought and partnering you're thinking about creative, you know, innovatively about those time frames that impact families. So so it's interesting you say that because we got a lot of feedback early on about starting and I'm from Connecticut too. So we never started before Labor mm -hmm. Day. We always went to the end of June. It was always very strange to me when I moved to Maryland as well. But we have gotten a lot of feedback about how difficult it is to find childcare at the end of August. Um we've also gotten a lot of feedback from people saying the opposite of that, which is they want to be able to, you know, make summer last as long as possible and then go to, you know, school starting after Labor Day. So it's 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 been interesting because, you know, sort of we're, we're kind of looking at both sides of that. Um, you know, our families that have older students have talked a lot about starting school early because of testing, because of internships, because of some of that that starts sort of the middle of June and on. Um, and some of our families talk about how they really want to enjoy summer and enjoy that month of August and not even think about school until after Labor Day. And so it's been a balance. And, you know, that's kind of why we've done a lot of this outreach and sort of put a lot of this out there to get that feedback, because. Yeah, no, I mean, it's 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 certainly been interesting and that that has always been a part of it. I think selfishly as a parent, I've always sort of had to battle that. Um but we've heard from a lot of different people about the, you know, sort of that end of August and June time, how challenging that is for camps and daycare and all of those services. I think what would be nice is if we kind of got on a traditional sort of schedule where people knew 
And then that way, maybe, you know, the rest of sort of around us could align as well and say, oh, you know, Montgomery County always starts here. So let me line up those camps or, you know, they always end here. So let me line that up. I think right. ultimately, right. you know, that would be, that would be ideal. Um, shifting the state requirement. Yeah. So the state, the state stuff is interesting. Um, Cause we've had a lot of people also question, you know, some of the the state mandated holidays and how, you know, they're very Christian aligned. And that was one of the first questions I asked um, our general counsel when I first started reading the policy. I was like, where does this come from? You know, like, and they said, you know, at one point this was, you know, sort of the way Maryland fell and that's when this was decided. And that's because it's state policy, you know, in, in some ways we are limited by those days, by those, you know, sort of days that we must take off by the number of days. So it's like days and hours is interesting. Yeah, the it's funny, the last, the after Labor Day calendar going to that, going to that 23rd, I've been going back and looking at old calendars and trying to figure out like, have there, have there been other calendars where we've had those weird sort of endings and beginnings? And there are, it just like certain, certain years there are things that are really good about the calendar and make it easy to figure out and there are other things that are frustrating um and we run into some of that for sure for sure I, i'm just trying to see if there's anything else yeah i mean if you have any specific feedback email it to me send it to me um put it in the survey because i am i am reading all of those comments um I went through the, all the ones today for policy management for tomorrow and i will go through all of them after that, um, cause it's really important and people took the time to do it. So I am taking the time to read them all, um, and kind of sort through them and see where there are trends. Cause I can only, you know, sort of speak for what people are sharing. And so it's really important to advocate for things, but thank you so much. I so appreciate it. I'm going to leave you with Donna, who's amazing. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Donna Clefman, if you would like to come off mute and provide us with a wealth of information. Yes, absolutely. It is hard to follow Kat and the um, calendar discussion, but I appreciate having some time on the agenda here tonight. I know you all have been sitting for some time now and we've gone through a lot of important topics. Um, I uh, feel blessed to be able to be here to talk to you about the Student Service Learning Program. Um, it is a graduation requirement for those who are diploma bound, but it is also um, a great uh, program that is accessible by all. And so I wanna talk to you a little bit about the requirement, but also talk about the, the wealth of opportunities that are available to our students with um, our nonprofit partners, two of which presented to you tonight, Montgomery County Recreation and the uh, Down Syndrome Network of Montgomery County. So. Happy to be here with you all. I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. So we'll go through a few things tonight. Um, just the overall definition of student service learning. So we're working from a common definition. We will talk about the state of Maryland requirements and how MCPS as a school system implements those requirements. And then we'll talk about opportunities that are available to students, both through our nonprofit partners and through our staff members, as well as our SSL awards, the forms that students can use um, to have their hours recorded, and the resources that our office has available to both students and families. So the definition of student service learning, it is a state graduation requirement um, for those students who are diploma bound. It really is a three-pronged three approach. Um, the first is what most people think about. It's students going out there and helping and caring for community in need um, and really addressing some real world issues that we have in our local communities. Uh, but it is also a chance for our students to really apply what they're learning within the classroom walls to those real world situations, right? Um, so that hands-on learning component um, and having those transferable skills that they can develop. And then the final part of the program is really uh, providing our students with the character skills and the social skills that they need to be active community members, to be able to um, serve as change makers within their communities, to be able to identify the problems that exist around us um, and to uh, lend a helping hand to address those problems. 
it is well rooted in our Be Well 365 program, just really understanding that it is a part of a student's comprehensive education for them to understand uh, what others are going through and how they can help to support the needs of those around them. We always like to talk about the benefits of the SSL program because um, while it is um, often spoken of as this is a requirement and our students need to complete it, there's so much that our students get from the program that we wanna make sure is really elevated in everybody's minds. Um, the first being that it is a, a phenomenal opportunity for our students to engage in career exploration, right? I always say um, anything that you can find in the for-profit world, you can also locate in the nonprofit world. So when students are engaging in these service learning experiences, they're really getting a chance to explore lots of different careers, lots of different interests that they might have and work alongside experts in those areas. Um, we have also seen that you know, service learning and, and staff and students involved in service and helping others really does promote well-being, right? When we can all take a step outside of ourselves and realize that the talents and skills that we have we can use um, in a positive manner to influence those around us, that's going to make us feel like we um, have agency and we're able to make the change that we, we know needs to, to be made. Real world application is another key piece of the program, right? Um, being able to see how, what the, the skills and concepts that they're learning in class uh, can have that real world impact because as we know all know, our students are gonna grow up and they're going to be those adults in those spaces making those changes. And even now as young students, they are able to make changes um, to the, the issues that are most important to them. And then finally, it is a graduation requirement um, for those students who are diploma bound, they are required to earn 75 hours to uh, earn the State of Maryland diploma. So those 75 hours, the students really can start the summer after completing fifth grade. We have many, many students who write, you know, that June 14th, I think this year, when they uh, finish the full school year, they're going to be able to start earning SSL hours and participating in SSL opportunities. They do have all throughout middle and high school to earn those 75 hours, but we really hope that they will um, complete that requirement as early as possible, right? Really with the notion that that 75 is a minimum, that's what we see that, that that's the minimum requirement to graduate, but many of our students go well above and beyond that 75 hours, and we encourage them to continue earning hours even after they've met the minimum requirement. Because it is a grade six through 12 program, if any student does enroll in MCPS after sixth grade, we do provide a waiver for the time in which they were not enrolled in MCPS. I always find that it's helpful um, to share that with students and families, um, especially because we do have quite a few students who enroll in, in MCPS after sixth grade. Um, the way that we calculate that enrollment rate waiver is really by school year. So if a student is ever um, not enrolled in MCPS for a full school year, they are essentially going to earn a 10 hour waiver towards that requirement. The only grade level where that shifts a little bit is for grade 10, um, where we apply a 15 hour wa waiver for grade 10. Um, and that really is because one, we need to be able to balance out that total 75, but also because in grade 10 is typically when students will um, take NSL as a required course and that course has 15 hours embedded into it. The waiver is really meant to account for those students who were previously enrolled in a school system that did not have a service learning program, um, did not have SSL opportunities for students or a way to track and verify hours for students. So we apply that waiver to account for the fact that they didn't have access to that program. We don't want to hold them accountable for that time. However, if your child was previously enrolled in a, a school system or a school district that did have a service learning program and did have a way of tracking those hours, we will transfer in the hours with official documentation, right? With a report card or a transcript, or even if the student was enrolled in a private school or a non-public school, sometimes they'll have um, a, a letter that they'll put on official school letterhead signed by the administrator. We can accept that as well. In every circumstance, we look at it as a, a case case by case basis, depending on the um, when the student is enrolling in MCPS and any hours that they're transferring in, will we apply an either or rule. So they'll either earn the enrollment waiver 
or we'll transfer in the hours, whichever is greater of the two. Uh, for our students who are working towards alternate learning outcomes, uh, we still do highly encourage them to participate in SSL opportunities for all of the same reasons, right? For all of those benefits, for them to be able to take advantage of the opportunities and to learn those skill sets. Uh, but it is not a requirement. So SSL is not a requirement to earn a certificate. It is only a requirement to earn the diploma. So for those students who are working towards a, a certificate, in ninth grade, our SSL coordinators will add a one-time 75-hour waiver to their SSL record, essentially waiving them of the requirement because they are not diploma bound and because they do not have to meet that requirement. That does not preclude any of our students who are working towards alternative learning outcomes from participating in SSL opportunities. And again, we really encourage them to do so um, and they can earn those hours um, and have those hours added to their record. It would just be in addition to that 75 hour waiver. Talking about the different types of service, I think is always a good place to um, start when we talk about opportunities. We have tons of opportunities available to students, both in person and virtually remotely, but they all fall under three big umbrella categories. The first being direct service. That's what many people think of when they think of service learning. They think of face-to-face -face contact with the recipients of the service, um, students who are tutoring other students, who are visiting patients in hospitals, um, serving at soup kitchens, uh, working with the elderly at assisted living facilities. Those are all direct service activities where the volunteers are directly interacting with the community in need. That is super valuable service and lots of um, great learning opportunities for our students are direct service. Um, but equally, I think as important and almost wider in reach is our, our, our indirect opportunities. And these are times when our students can help um, serve a community in need by channeling the correct resources to the organi organizations that are working directly with that community in need. These indirect opportunities do need to be directly supervised, right? So um, when we talk about indirect, we're talking about food drives, clothing drives, thons, fundraisers, environmental projects that students are completing either with nonprofit organizations in a public space or with staff members back at the schoolhouse. And then the last type of service is advocacy service. Um, and this we're seeing growing um, in terms of the type of service. We're seeing a lot more opportunities that are advocacy opportunities, because frankly speaking, a lot of the community needs um, that are bubbling up right now are ones that need advocacy work, right? We need people to be aware of the issue and the cause. We need every communi community member to pitch in and support that, that need or cause and tackle the issue. And we need um, local legislators to act on it. So many of our students are very actively engaged in these advocacy projects where they, where they are educating others about a particular cause or issue and teaching them and advocating for the change that will help to eliminate that cause. The other basic building blocks of SSL is just talking about the phases of service learning. Um, and I think it's always important to mention these because it really is uh, service learning. The program itself needs to carefully balance these three stages. The first is preparation, right? Our students need to know why they're doing what they're doing and how they should go about doing it. So when we train our nonprofit partners and when we talk with our school staff members about hosting service learning opportunities, we are really asking them to start the beginning with a tutorial, right? With some sort of orientation, letting the students know about the community that they are serving, those important statistics, those that important information, and then also teaching them the skills that they need to actively engage in the service activity, not to just throw them in directly to action, right? To really get them prepared so that they understand what they're about to uh, accomplish together. And then they move into the action part, right? And that's where they're meeting that recognized need. They're developing the responsibilities. Um, they are they're owning the activity because they understand the importance and they know how to do it um, so that they can be uh, engaged in that hands-on learning. 
And then reflection is listed last, but we all know it, it is ongoing, right? Um, good teaching and learning really is centered on reflection. So we do require that the students throughout the opportunity are actively reflecting on their individual um, presence in that, in that situation, the, their in individual contributions, and also their collective impact on the community and the, the need that they are trying to serve. At the very end, when they fill out the SSL form, which I will show you um, in just a few minutes, students are required to uh, uh, supply a written reflection so that we are sure that they understand what they have learned from this experience and what they're taking away from it. Okay, in terms of breaking down the 75 hours, um, students and families always ask, you know, how, how do students go about earning these hours? The first way is through their specific core courses. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see I've listed the core courses that students participate in and the number of hours that are associated with that course. In each of those courses, as long as the students successfully complete the course and the service project that's embedded in it, they will earn the accompanying number of hours. And our staff members are trained um, in the projects that are embedded into each one of these courses um, so that they can implement with them with students and support students with earning those hours. If you quickly do the math, it's about 50 hours that we build into those core courses out of the 75. It's the additional 25 that we ask students to go and earn outside of class. And that might be through our nonprofit partners through, uh, we have over 900 nonprofit partners that we work with in Montgomery County, or it might be through one of the organizations that have not yet become a partner just because they haven't learned enough about the program. Our students can work with any registered nonprofit in the county, or it might be with staff members through in-house school-based opportunities. Because SSL is a state for graduation requirement, um, everything does need to be approved. We need to make sure that it follows the state mandates and guidelines and requirements. Um, so one way that we do that is by partnering with the Montgomery County Volunteer Center. We are very fortunate as a district to have a, a county government run volunteer center. With them, we um, connect with organizations, nonprofits in the area, and we go through a training with them to be able to get them certified, to be able to offer SSL opportunities to our students. Um, on this slide deck, you'll have your, these two pink links are gonna be super helpful. They'll take you to all of the organizations that are certified SSL organizations and all of the SSL opportunities that are available to students. And they will all have this MCPS SSL graduation cap icon on them to indicate that they have um, gone through that approval process with us. The other option is if you find a nonprofit organization that is not listed on the Montgomery County Volunteer Center website as an SSL organization, you are always welcome to apply for pre-approval, right? So we have a pre-approval form, it's linked here. Um, it is technically called the individual SSL request form, uh, but on it, students are filling out the information, their information, the nonprofit organization is filling out their information, and then our school-based SSL coordinators are reviewing that information to see if it qualifies for the SSL program. Uh, that form is super important. Um, we want to not be in the business of breaking students' hearts uh, when they've already served hours with an organization, only to find out that it doesn't qualify for the SSL program. So it's always better if, you, if you're not sure, if they're, if they're not on the Volunteer Center website, complete the pre-approval form so that we can check it out for you ahead of time um, and make sure that it qualifies before students go and serve those hours. Our virtual remote opportunities are very popular with our um, students. We resurrected these guidelines during the pandemic because we had to pivot and it wasn't safe for our students to go out to the community to serve. So we had to come up with opportunities that they could do from the safety of their home. And we received so much good feedback about it from our nonprofit partners and from students and families and staff as well that we decided to leave those um, guidelines in place. So there are specific guidelines that are linked on this slide, but essentially all of the virtual remote opportunities do need to be completed under the remote sponsorship of a nonprofit representative or, or an MCPS staff member. So they're still being supervised, they're just being remotely supervised. 
and they um, should be posted on the Volunteer Center website and tagged with the blue MCPS SSL graduation cap icon. The specific guidelines, if you're interested, are linked here. Um, they really were written very carefully by our general counsel to ensure that student safety um, is at the forefront of every one of those opportunities and to ensure that we have the proper uh, supervision and monitoring that we need for a state graduation requirement. All of our virtual remote opportunities are available at this quick bit.ly link. Uh, so if your student is interested in looking for some of those opportunities that they can take advantage of from home, they can go directly to this virtual SSL 2020 link. Uh, we're getting close to the end. The SSL awards, um, we do have two awards that we offer to students, um, really trying to encourage them again to complete the minimum 75 hours as early as they can. So if a student does earn those 75 hours before the end of middle school, they will earn the superintendent's SSL award. Um, that is the complete 75. The, a question I often get from parents is about the um, grade eight social studies course, because that course comes with 10 hours. Students don't have those hours in time for the SSL award because we need to pool the data earlier in the school year to be able to print those certificates and get them to students before the end of the school year. But those course-based SSL hours don't come in until the end of the school year when report card grades are processed and we know that a student has passed the course. So if a student is in eighth grade and they're looking to achieve this award, they will need to earn the 75 hours without counting those 10 hours from eighth grade social studies. The other award that we have is the Certificate of Meritorious Service for our high school students. If any high school student earns 240 SSL hours or more uh, by the time that they graduate, they earn the Certificate of Meritorious Service and then they also receive a special purple tassel that they can wear um, affixed to their graduation cap when they graduate. So all of that maybe has led you to think, hey, I wanna know how many hours are on my student's um, SSL record. The best way that you can do that is through student and parent view. Um, we worked very closely with Synergy to make sure that you were able to see all the information that we're able to see. So when you go to course history in student and parent view, you're gonna scroll all the way down you'll see a section that says service learning hours earned. And in that section, you'll see whether your student has met or hasn't met the requirement. You'll see the requirement, which is 75 for every student, unless they are um, certificate uh, students. And then the um, number of hours that they have earned will be reported there as well. It is super helpful if you toggle on, I know it's hard to see here, um, but on student and parent view, there is a little details button that you can turn to on. And when you turn it on, it'll turn green. And that will allow you to see the student's full SSL record. So line by line, you'll be able to see every entry on the, on the SSL record that the SSL coordinator has entered. And then the last few slides are really just resources for you. The first is just a, a screenshot of what that SSL activity verification form looks like. Anytime a student participates in an SSL opportunity, they should bring this form with them. It's their responsibility to fill out section one, which is their student information. They serve at the opportunity and then they hand the form to the nonprofit supervisor who will then fill out section two of the form. And then they will turn the form back to the students for the students to go home and fill out section three, which is that written reflection. There are guiding questions there for the students. Um, and so students can always use those questions to be able to um, guide their reflection. But do we, we do ask that they provide a thoughtful and meaningful reflection about their experience. And then they can turn the form into the middle school and high, or high school SSL coordinator, which is also linked on this page. The other form that I just wanted you to have at your fingertips is that SSL request form. So it is linked here and, and in this screenshot. Um, again, we do ask that students, if they want to serve with a nonprofit that's not listed on the Volunteer Center website, that they fill out this pre-approval form and submit it to the SSL coordinator at least two weeks prior to service. All of our SSL coordinators are stipended individuals. Um, so they do the SSL coordinator role in addition to their 
primary um, job responsibility. So we always like to make sure that they have enough time to review the form and get back to you. So submit at least two weeks prior to service so that they can um, make that turnaround happen. Our due dates and deadlines are here for the year. We um, accept SSL forms on a rolling basis. In fact, we encourage students to turn in forms as soon as they complete them, right? We don't want students to hold on to, the, to them for too long. Number one, we don't want students to risk forgetting about them or losing them. Number two, we want our SSL coordinators um, to be able to process them um, throughout the school year, not be inundated at the end of the school year. So we encourage students to turn in the forms as soon as they can. We only have two required deadlines for the entire school year. The first is April 5th, and that is our awards deadline. So any student who wants to be considered for one of the awards does need to submit all of their SSL forms by April 5th. There's no other additional paperwork that they need to fill out, nothing um, else that they need, no forms that they need to complete in addition to the, just the activity verification forms. They just need to turn in all those forms so that our coordinators can review and process them all and get the hours added to their record. Again, we put that deadline earlier in the school year because it takes time for our SSL coordinators to review all the forms. And then at the central office level, we pool a data uh, pool of all of the students who have met the requirements. And then we send it to our um, editorial or graphics and publishing service to print the actual certificates and get them back to schools in time to distribute before the end of the school year. The other required deadline is May 31st this year. It's typically the last Friday in June, but the way that our school calendar um, shakes out this year, it is uh, the last Friday in May. Um, so that is May 31st. All of the forms need to be turned in by then for any service completed after June 1st, up until, or June 1st, 2023, up until June 1st, 2024. So we just bookended at the end of the school year that anything that's been, um, any service that's been completed, those forms should be turned in by May 31st. All of our resources are linked here. We have translated our major um, the guidance documents for parents and families into all of the eight major languages. So they're all linked directly on this page. For our students and families, uh, this, the SSL hub is really the, the best place, kind of the one-stop shop. It's really a Google spreadsheet where we've linked all of the materials and resources that we've built out for our students and families. So that is the best place to go. But if you need just a quick link, um, these other uh, documents are available as well. And then if you're thinking, well, how do I even get my student students started? This slide is the best one to share with them. They can click into all of the opportunities directly. They can you know, look at how they can check their SSL record on student and parent view. And then it gives our um, major uh, resources for students quick links there as well. And then this brings me to my last slide where I'll just show you, I do have the links for all of the SSL opportunities here, um, as well as our SSL main SSL webpage, the SSL hub, and then our SSL Dropbox information is there. SSL at mcpsmd.org is the best place way to contact our office. I've also linked the um, contact list for each one of our SSL coordinators. There is one at every middle school and high school. So if you have specific questions about your student, um, you are welcome to reach out directly to your school-based contact. And then if you have additional questions about the program, feel free to reach out to our office. I did see the chat lighting up. So I don't know if, um, if there were any questions in there that I can take a look at and see if I can. So the one question that I did see was how you monitor, or how do you monitor the advocacy how do you monitor the advocacy projects, especially the letter writing? Great question. So all of our projects are monitored by either a nonprofit, adult nonprofit representative or an MCPS staff member. Um, so those projects have to be fashioned and designed by either the nonprofit or the MCPS staff member. They come up with very clear criteria and expectations um, for the opportunity. Uh, they make sure that students understand the purpose that they're serving, the context, contextual information that they need to know to be able to engage in that advocacy service. And then they collect right at the final um, mark of the project, they collect what the students have compiled, they review it. If they need to provide feedback and ask the student to, to add more or tweak it, they'll provide that feedback and then they will award the hours based on um, successful completion. 
I did not see any other questions. Um, that just means that you were pretty thorough then. How about that? Wonderful. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. And any questions, feel free to reach out to our office directly. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So um, we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to um, have the executive director of the Maryland Community Connections, uh, Ms. Andre Bruno. Is, uh, is it Andrea or Andre? It's Andre. Andre, thank you for correcting me. I apologize. Um, I'm not going to try again because I don't want to butcher your name. That's not okay. And Ms. Catherine Lucas Logbo, did I say that? Yeah. That is correct. Um, thank you so much. So please, with no further ado, um, please share your um, resources with us. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us here. Um, I'm going to do just a quick overview of, of some of the services for our agency, and Catherine will do specifically for the list, so you can uh, screen the um, my name is Andre Coates, and Catherine, I'm sorry, Kimberlyn Snyder is also the co-founder for Merlin Community Connection, and we both have loved ones with disabilities and started the organization 22 years ago. We're currently in Prince George County, and we provide services also in Montgomery County. Next. Um, one of our programs is our supportive employment. So we have served some of the TY students in that particular program that was aging out and coming into DDA services. And that program provides independent placement only for individuals that want to work in jobs out in the community. Uh, they are provided job development, uh, transportation, uh, job coaching services, but just remember Remember, all referrals for that program is for um, individuals that are looking to work in jobs uh, out in the community independently. The next one is our summer employment youth program. And this is through the DOORS program where we serve kids 14 through 21. However, it's only for Prince George County um, students. So I would encourage you to contact your DOORS office in Montgomery County for their summer youth program. And it will probably start kicking off in like February. So it'll be right around the corner where the students have to apply for those services. Next. Um, our personal support program is for individuals that are in Prince George County and Montgomery County, and this is where families receive a staffing supports for recreational activities, medical appointments, grocery store shopping, all community-based type activities, and that's available through the DDA program. Next, we also have our annual food and toy drive program that has started and we've started collecting donations in which we give out to um, families that are in need. And the next one is our annual um, food delivery baskets where uh, every month we deliver uh, food to needy families and um, so I'm going to turn it over to Catherine. So she'll be talking to you about our LIST program. Thank you, Ms. Coates. Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Lucas Logbo, and I'm the LIST manager here for Maryland Community Connection. I'm here today to explain how the community can benefit from our services provided by LIST. For starters, LIST is the abbreviation for Low Intensity Support Services. This is a DDA-funded program that provides up to $2,000 to assist families and adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities to live happy, healthy, and independent lives in our community. The goal for LIST is to assist families in a wide range of categories to include, but not limited to, adaptive equipment, assistive technology, caregiving services, educational services, home modification. On the next page. Yes, home modification, reimbursement services, um, transportation, and many more. I bet you are wondering how you or someone you know can take part in this amazing opportunity. Here's how. The first step will be to apply. 
We are now accepting applications until November 30th, 2023. The application can be found on our website. I will also provide a link to the application at the end of this presentation. The starting process is a quick one-page application that asks for basic information, such as the applicant's name, date of birth, the social security number, and parent's name and email. How to know if LIST can assist with you or your loved one. To qualify, you will first need to be diagnosed with a developmental or intellectual disability. There is no age requirement to apply for LIST funding. So that means we encourage everyone to apply young and old. Once you apply for LIST, you will receive a confirmation email. All applications are entered into a random drawing. DDA is scheduled to host the random selection drawing on December 15, 2023. MCC will then have 20 business days to send notifications to families. To give an estimate time frame, you will receive notification until January. We send three types of letters to families. The first letter is a denial letter. You or your loved one will receive this letter if you are currently receiving DDA services. The second letter will be informing you that you or your loved one have been added to our wait list. The third notification that we send is a letter letting you know that you have been selected. The selection letter will include the next steps in the list process. This letter will also include deadlines to turn in documents and the link to our website for required documents such as the family guidebook, vendor letters, the service eligibility form, and more. Families will then turn in their loved one's completed packet for review and processing. I like to inform our families that this is not an overnight process. The list process takes up to 90 days to be completed. Once we complete the process, we send final notification to families, informing the, uh, them of the items that we purchased and the payments that were made. This is the list process and we do encourage everyone to apply today. Thank you. Um, I also wanna piggyback on Catherine, just a reminder, it is a DDA program. However, families do not have to apply for DDA services. They do not have to be on the wait list for services. They do have to have a developmental or intellectual disability and live in the state of Maryland. Yes. And they have put in um, the uh, the link for the random selection application in the chat. Uh, in reference to your students, I will say that um, this is the time for them to apply um, because of your TYs. If they are already receiving DDA services, they will not be able to access this pool of money. So as long as they're not receiving any DDA services or in a waiver, including the autism waiver, they can apply for the list services. Yes, if you go back to the um, uh, number nine screen, someone asked about therapeutic services. And so if you see number I, um, the wellness, physical and mental health. So we provide, we pay up to $2,000 for um, all types of therapeutic services. The good thing is uh, we had the young lady that was talking about the Maryland Park and Planning, um, the recreational services camp and um, community uh, services is part of this. For a long time, it was not part of this. Um, the state always considered recreational service a luxury type of service. And so now um, it's been a lot of advocacy around the need for social integration. I see a question that said there are two rounds. If you are not chosen for the first round, you could apply for the second round. That is correct. So for the list funding, you can only receive funding once per physical year. So if you applied and received funding for round one, you will automatically be denied for round two. However, if you missed the funding for round one or was still added to the wait list and have not come off, we do encourage you to apply for round two because it is a random selection and your name may be chosen.
it's called wait time. Just want to make sure I give people an opportunity to ask any other <laughs> questions. We have one. Is insurance connected to it? So um, no. Go ahead, Ms. Coates. Um, uh, in reference to insurance, and if a person does have insurance, co-pays is something that we also pay in ref for um, services. So if a family has or is using therapeutic services and they have to pay co-pays every visit, um, that cost is covered under the list. And if an individual do, do not have insurance at all, um, then we still will cover the calls up to everything is up to two thousand dollars. So whatever family requests is up to two thousand. Yes. So I see another question. Are learning differences in social emotional needs considered qualifying for list? Well, they cannot stand on their own. It has to be an intellectual or develop developmental disability along with those um, learning differences and emotional needs as long as mental illnesses as well and also adhd will not stand on its own it has to have a intellectual or developmental disability attached to it i will give you a tip um if families apply for dda services and they get accepted or placed on the wait list mm. that letter can be used for documentation for a person's disability. And so DDA does have a sw small program where they serve individuals that may not have a developmental or intellectual disability. And so if they get on that wait list, you just turn in that one page that DDA gives you to say, I'm on the wait list and we won't need any documentation that normally would disqualify um, a child. Mata asked Someone... my question uh, over yes. the phone. Is that okay? Um, uh, just curious. Yes. Um, so the, 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 the 14 designations, right? So OHI or the health impairment, you know, or developmental delay, which my daughter currently is under as for speech delays, um, mm -hmm. OT and social emotional. Is that, would that be considered or no? Um, so, like, yeah. I'm just kind of confused where, like, the parameters. Because somebody also asked about the autism. My daughter doesn't have autism. She has developmental delays. So autism is definitely covered um, okay. under the list um, program. Uh, developmentally delayed would be under the list program. However, we do review probably the IEP. However, Great. other diagnosis it by itself will not. Someone could be duly diagnosed, but by, by itself, where the only thing that the school has um, placed on in document is, say, um, learning disability or uh, emotional diagnosis or a language impairment. Those diagnoses in itself would not qualify for list. Right. It has, so, okay. And so that's why I encourage families that may be challenged to be diagnosed to qualify for the list, just always apply for DDA. And more than likely you could get on their wait list and you just use that paperwork. But as you can see, a lot of a lot of services that families can access. I always tell families um, when I'm talking to them, they say, "Well, I didn't find anything." It's it's something in there. Um, yes. <laughs> a favorite category is B assistive technology, where we we have purchased hundreds of computers, iPhones, iPads, headphones, um, and so just a lot of opportunity for families to receive the services and it's fiscal year. And so if you get services one fiscal year, you can apply again for the next fiscal year. And also one of the other categories, I know it was mentioned for um, summer camp. 
Summer camp may qualify under list if it is a um, accredited uh, camp by the state of Maryland. So it's a wide variety of categories. There's always something to assist. Great. Thank you so very much. This was wonderful Thank information. You. Um, Thank if, you. If, um, if there are any questions, um, certainly reach out to me. Uh, I can I can pass on information um, to um, get information from our, our, our list experts. And um, this was this was wonderful. Thank you for for joining us this evening and, and filling us in on this opportunity. Um, I have a quick few items uh, to, to summarize before we wrap up tonight. Um, Dr. McKnight will be joining us um, December 18th is our next CCAC meeting. And um, we wanted to reach out to gather some information from you about some areas of interest or questions that you have. Um, I have created a link here. I'm gonna drop it in the chat. You can click on this form and you can list your questions um, that you may have for Dr. McKnight. Um, again, our next meeting, we just got the date, will be December 18th. We'll be sending out um, notification and reminders along with the link for that meeting coming up. Um, last meeting, we asked for your feedback on feedback. Uh, and, and we got um, a Small return on our, our, our ask for that, but uh, the energy was around these er following areas of topics of interest for our future CCAC meetings as we were planning for, for the rest of this year. Um, and so I listed them below so you could see where the energy was around supporting inclusion, ways parents can support inclusion, partner partnering with the IEP team for successful collaboration, um, uh, taking a look at uh, our strategic plan for MCPS and the resources um, and strategies we're using to address and improve student outcomes, um, along with additional information on discrete services that are provided here in Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, there was some energy around uh, getting updates from the state um, advisory committee um, as well as transitions. And I know that question surfaced in, in the chat and we are planning to have um, a meeting where we can uh, discuss um, successful transitions for and, and really specialize in, in your area, uh, pre-K to K, elementary to middle and, and middle to high. Um, we do um, continue um, to seek your feedback. Um, Derek, you can go to the next slide. Um, if you have additional topics that you're interested in, in, in hearing about, please you know, submit, I'll drop this in the chat too, but use this link to provide uh, your ideas and information, your areas or your questions, um, as well as request an interpreter or sign up for public comment. Um, I, I monitor that and we, I will reach out to you if you sign up and you have a, a date of interest that you would like to sign up for public comment, I will follow up with you uh, to discuss it prior to the meeting, but please use this link uh, to do so. Last but not least, uh, we wanna hear, you know, one more time, it's it's like the, the list of surveys. One more survey, but we wanna hear uh, feedback from you um, about our meetings. Um, it's important to us. Uh, we wanna make these meaningful uh, to you. And so we very much appreciate your time to answer a few short questions to provide us that feedback. Uh, so there's a QR code that you can, you can click on there to provide our uh, feedback to us about our CCAC meetings. Um, so I appreciate all of you joining us this evening. Um, uh, thank you to all our presenters. Uh, I know there's a lot of information presented tonight, but it was some great resources. Um, and um, I, we look forward to seeing you in December, which is a Monday. Thank you uh, for, for pointing that out. We are usually on Thursdays, but our December meeting will be on a Monday. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Good night. Good night.